Hey everyone, my name is Jason. To quote Gary Paulson, name the book that made the biggest impression on you. I bet you read it before you hit puberty. In the time I've got left, I intend to write artistic books, books for kids, because they're still open to new ideas, end quote. Gary Paulson was exactly that for me. Paulson was born May 17, 1939. He grew up in a broken home. His mother struggled with alcoholism, and he didn't start living with her until, she was, until he was seven years old. He had many challenges as a child, including being abducted by a child molester that he then watched his mother beat to death. Paulson forged his father's signature and joined the army at age 17. He then started working in factory, building missiles. He got his start with writing lines for television shows and fell in love with it. The rest was history. Gary Paulson writes about regular, everyday characters who struggle, but then overcome their challenges. He is most known for his Hatchet series, but a lot of his novels are a tale of coming of age, battling the wilderness. He has written over 200 novels and even more magazine articles. As a child, I only ever read because I was forced to. I remember the teacher pulling out Hatchet as our next novel of study, and I, and I didn't want to do the homework that evening. I was required to read the first two chapters, but I came back that Monday with the whole novel read. I still remember the gut feeling I had when reading about his secret and wondering how I would react if I found my mother had cheated on my father. I vividly remember holding my breath as I read about the bear walking into his camp or as he swam down to the plane to, get su to gather supplies. Here's the chapter that follows along with that gut-wrenching moment. Brian worked around the tail of the plane two more times, pulling himself along the stabilizer and the elevator, but there simply wasn't a way in. Stupid, he thought. I was stupid to think I could just come out here and get inside the plane. Nothing is that easy. Not out here. Not in this place. Nothing is easy. He slammed his fist against the body of the plane, and to his complete surprise, the aluminum covering gave easily under his blow. He hit it again, and once more it bent and gave, and he found that even when he didn't strike it, but just pushed it, it still moved. It was really, he thought, very thin aluminum skin over that kind of skeleton, and if it gave that easily, he might be able to force his way through. The hatchet, he, the hatchet, the hatchet, he might be able to cut or hack with the, with the hatchet. He reached into his belt and pulled the hatchet out, picked a place where the aluminum gave to his push, and then took an experimental swing at it. The hatchet cut through the aluminum as if it were soft cheese. He couldn't believe it. Three more hacks and he had a triangular hole the size of his hand. He could see four cables that he guessed were control cables going back to the tail and he hit the, he hit the skin of the plane with a frenzied series of hacks to make it a still larger opening. He was bending a piece of aluminum away from the other from the two aluminum braces and some kind and some kind when he dropped the hatchet. It went straight past his legs. He felt it bump his foot and then go down, down into the water, and for a second he only he couldn't understand that he had what he had just done. For all this time, all the living and fighting, the hatchet had been everything. He had always worn it. Without the hatchet he had nothing. No fire, no tools, no weapon. He was nothing. The hatchet was and had been him. And he had dropped it. Ugh! He yelled, choke on, choked on it, a snarling cry of rage at his own carelessness. The hole in the plane was still too small to use for anything, and now he didn't have a tool. That was the kind of thing I would have done before, he said, to the lake, to the sky, and to the trees. When I came here, I would have done that. Not now. Not now. Yet he had, and he had hung on the raft for a moment and felt sorry for himself, for his own stupidity. But as before, the self-pity didn't help, and he knew that he had only one course of action. He had to get, he had to get the hatchet back. He had to dive and get it back. But how deep was it? The, the deep end of the gym pool at the school he had no trouble getting to the bottom of, and that was about 11 feet, he was pretty sure. 
Here was, here it was impossible to know the exact depth. The front end of the plane, anchored by the weight of the engine, was obviously on the bottom, but it came back up at an angle, so the water wasn't as deep as the plane was long. He pulled himself out of the water to his chest so his chest could expand. He took two deep breaths and swiveled and dove, pulling his arms, kicking off the raft bottom with his feet. His first thrust took him down a good seven or eight feet, but the visibility was only five feet beyond that. He could not see the bottom yet. He clawed down five or six more feet, the pressure pushing on his ears until he held his nose and popped them. And just as he ran out of breath, he headed back up. He thought he saw the bottom, still four feet below the bottom of his dive. He exploded out of the surface, bumping his head on the side of the elevator when he came back up and took air like a whale, pushing the, the stale air out until he wheezed, talking, taking new air in. He would, he would have to go deeper and yet still have time to search while he was down there. Stupid, he thought, once more cursing himself, just dumb. He pulled air again and again, pushing his chest in and out until he could not possibly get any more capacity. Then he took one more deep, longful breath and dove again. This time he made an arrow out of his arms and he used his legs to push off the bottom of the raft. All he had in his legs to spring and snap to propel him down. As soon as he felt himself slowing a bit, he started raking back with his arms and sides like paddles, thrusting with his legs like a frog. This time, he was so successful that he ran his face into the bottom of the mud. He shook his head to clear his eyes and looked around. The plane disappeared out and down in front of him. He, he thought he could see the windows, and then made and that made him think again of the pilot sitting inside that, that he forced his thoughts from it, from it. But he could not see the hatchet. Bad air triggers were starting to go off in his brain, and he knew he was limited to seconds now, but he held for a moment and tried moving out a bit. Just as he ran out of air, knew that he was going to have to, to blow soon. He saw a handle sticking out of the mud. He made one grab, missed, reached again, felt his fingers close, close on the rubber and clutched and clutched it in one motion slammed his feet down into the mud and powered himself up but now his lungs were ready to explode and he had flashes of color in his brain explosions of color and he could have to take a pool of water take it to his lungs just as he had opened his mouth to take air in to pull it in to pull in all the water in the lake his head blew out of the surface and into the light so that was kind of the chapter. Um, what I would have done here for this, for an activity for this, um, is I would have the kids build a diorama for my project. Um, they, would, they would be required to complete and build the diorama of Bryant's camp using text evidence from the book. And then this would, this would give students a chance to apply their knowledge of the book and to make inferences on what they have read to fill any gap any gap. So this would be just a kind of something they would have to come up with.